There are some crimes that demand meticulous, planning, impeccable timing, and or genius level intelligence. But in the video today, we're looking at 10 thefts that do not fall into any of those categories. Instead, these are tales of things that were almost too easy to steal. Number 10. Keeping the Change City mechanic James Bagarozzo was charged with ensuring Buffalo, New York's parking meters were in good and working order. But the way he fixed the meters wasn't exactly what the city had in mind. Bagarozzo rigged about 70 of the city's 1,200 meters so that instead of dropping into the collection canister, quarters would collect on top, where he could have simply scoop them up. Bagarozzo would then roll the quarters up at home and exchange them at the bank for cash, explaining to tellers that his plethora of quarters came from a friend's vending machine business. All this small change added up and Bagarozzo literally pocketed himself more than $200,000. Because he wasn't skimming money from all the meters, the scheme went unnoticed for eight years until a new parking commissioner noticed that the city's digital parking meters, which had no quarters to steal, were making more money than the old coin-fed variety, launching an investigation that eventually pulled in the local police and the FBI. Bagarozzo and a fellow employee were caught on tape tampering with the machines and more than $45,000 in cash and quarters was found at the man's home. Bagarozzo, who blamed his gambling addiction for driving him to crime, pled guilty and agreed to pay $210,000 in restitution and was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. After Bagarozzo and his colleague were caught, the city's meter revenue increased by more than $500,000 a year, raising the possibility that the pair may have made off with even more quarters than the authorities had suspected. Number 9. The Million Dollar Fajita Heist over a period of nine years, Cameron County Juvenile Justice Department employee Gilberta Escamilla managed to steal over $1.25 million from his employer in the form of stolen fajitas, which she then resold. He likely would have been able to continue his scheme indefinitely, too, if it weren't for an ill-timed doctor's appointment. By the time he was caught, Escamilla had his routine down to a science. He would order the fajitas, accept the delivery, and then resell the fajitas. According to the DA, he would literally, on the day he ordered them, deliver them to customers he had already lined up. Escamilla's black market fajita operation hit a snag when he missed work for a doctor's appointment. When a food service vendor called him to inform the facility of an imminent delivery of 800 pounds of fajitas, the kitchen worker, who answered the phone in Escamilla's place, immediately responded correctly that the facility did not serve fajitas. However, the driver insisted that he had been delivering fajitas there for almost a decade. A subsequent investigation turned up some telltale fajitas in Escamilla's fridge, and audits of purchase contracts and his customers' records showed the extent of the fajita resell operation. Escamilla pled guilty to theft by a public official and received a sentence that was, like his fajita orders, supersized. He got 50 years in prison. Number 8. Hitting up the ATM When you think of ATM-related crimes, you might picture a thief using a stolen credit card to access cash or even holding up ATM customers for cash. But one gang of criminals in New York City found an easier way to get the cash out of the ATMs. Just pull them open and take the cash. The group started off using hand tools, but moved on to using chains connected to cars to pull the front piece away from the ATM, leaving the cash easily accessible. Conveniently, the getaway car is then already backed up to the machine for easy loading. The team netted between $1,300 and $12,000 in each of the 70-plus thefts that have been attributed to them. They were stealing from ATMs at small merchants like bodegas, pizzerias, and convenience stores. If you're thinking that that amount of money is probably not even enough to cover the car repair, well, your thinking is correct, but you know, the gang used stolen cars to commit the thefts, so there's that. Number 7. Stealing 100,000 Tiny Bottles Those tiny bottles of booze served on airlines may not seem like much, especially on a long flight, but for a team of Sky Chef workers at JFK Airport, they quickly added up. The Sky Chef employees were responsible for removing any unsold bottles after each flight and moving them into a storage facility at the airport. The first part of their job went totally fine, but instead of moving them to the warehouse, they put them in bags and drove them to their personal vehicles in the employee parking lot. The team bribed the security guards who were supposed to be searching them on the way out with, you guessed it, tiny bottles of liquor. The Port Authority team investigating the thefts in Operation Last Call eventually arrested 18 airport truck drivers and guards for stealing more than 100,000 little bottles of liquor, as well as duty-free merchandise. One suspect's home contained over 50,000 miniature liquors, as well as $34,000 in cash. But these Sky Chef employees, they weren't the only ones to have this idea. In 2015, a flight attendant for a regional affiliate of Delta Airlines was caught stealing miniature bottles of alcohol, part of a trove of more than 1,500 she had stolen during her employment with the airline. Number 6. Flying Away 
Stealing a vintage fighter plane out of a museum seems like it would be a complex undertaking, but for one Israeli military pilot, it proved to be surprisingly easy. In the early 80s, Air Force Reserve Major Israel Yitzhaki managed to convince Israel's Air Force Museum that the World War II era plane needed painting, and he was the man for the job. As promised, Yitzhaki did do some restoration work on the plane over the next few years. However, eventually, Yitzhaki registered the plane in his own name, and in 1986, he flew it to Sweden, where he sold it for $331,000. The theft was eventually discovered, and six years later, the missing aircraft was traced through Interpol. In 1992, Yitzhaki Saki was tried and convicted of theft, forgery, and fraud for swiping the Mustang fighter plane. Number 5. Valet Thieving Stealing a car usually requires some degree of skill, prying a window open, hot wiring the vehicle, and or hacking the car's electronic systems. But for some enterprising car thieves, swiping a car was as easy as putting their hands out to take the keys from unsuspecting drivers. So why would the owners just hand over the keys to their car? Well, that's because they thought they were checking them in to be valet parked. In one case in Houston, the thief waited until an employee's brake left the valet stand unattended and just stepped up to the podium. When Bowman Messer dropped off his 2011 Toyota Camry at the valet stand, the thief handed him a claim ticket. It wasn't until the end of the day when he came to get his car that he realized that it had been stolen. Further, in two incidents in Philadelphia, thieves posed as garage attendants hopping into the still-running cars that the customers dropped off. A similar theft took place in Chicago, though that stolen car was recovered after the man who pretended to be the valet tried to return the recently purchased items that he found in the car. Number 4. Taking the Cash, the Chips, and the Cat Despite what movies might suggest, most casino heists end with the thieves being caught, usually during or shortly after the attempted theft. However, in 1992, a lone thief seemingly robbed the Stardust Casino of half a million dollars in cash and chips, simply walking out the door and disappearing without a trace. So how did he do it? William Brennan was a clerk at the Stardust Sportsbook. Part of his job entailed counting the nightly take and then turning it into the cashier, meaning if he was seen carrying around a pile of cash or chips, it wouldn't raise any suspicions. On September 23, 1992, a half hour before he was supposed to drop the cash and chips at the cashier, Brennan apparently simply walked out of the casino, though he avoided being recorded on the security cameras as he did so. The casino called the police shortly after the money wasn't turned in on schedule, but it was too late. No trace was ever found of Brennan, whose beloved cat disappeared from his apartment with him. Maybe Brennan made a clean fate, or as some speculate, maybe he met a darker fate at the hands of the Mafia. Number 3. Getting Stoned Costa Mesa jeweler Charles Jason Hansen came up with an almost perfect crime. When resetting or improving jewelry for clients who considered him a friend, Hansen would swap out customers' diamonds for cubic zirconia or fakes. To the naked eye, the stones were identical, so people didn't know that they'd been duped by Hansen. It was only when one client took the upgraded engagement ring she had received back from Hansen to another jeweler for an insurance appraisal that she learned that her diamond was a fake, a revelation that left her gutted. As authorities investigated that case, they learned of at least 11 other clients whose stones had been switched out over a two-year period. Hansen was ultimately convicted of several charges of burglary and theft, receiving a prison sentence of more than six years. The prosecutor in the case said this type of crime might often go unnoticed and unreported, saying, It's probably out there more than we think. A lot of people trust their jeweler, and they don't go to a second jeweler. Number 2. Just walking out of the museum with the Mona Lisa under your coat. In 1911, security at the Louvre in Paris was nowhere near as tight as it is today, and Leonardo's Mona Lisa had not yet reached its current iconic status in the public consciousness. Nonetheless, it does seem surprising that someone was just able to take it off the museum's wall and walk out with it. But on August the 21st, Vincenzo Perugia, a handyman who worked with the firm that installed the glass over the Louvre's paintings, well, he did just that. After spending the night with a couple of associates in an art supply closet at the Louvre, Perugia removed the painting from its case and frame. Then he slipped the painting, which was on boards so that it couldn't be rolled up like a canvas under his white worker's smock, and he simply walked out. It was more than a day before the painting's theft was noticed. Most museum workers and guests assumed that it had been taken out of the gallery to be photographed. But once it was, the Mona Lisa's disappearance made headlines around the world. Perugia may have gotten the painting out of the Louvre easily, and even successfully navigated routine questioning the police conducted with all Louvre employees, but the subsequent attention made unloading it almost impossible. He left the Mona Lisa hidden in the bottom of a trunk in his room for a couple of years, but was eventually caught while trying to sell it in Italy 
though not before others, including Pablo Picasso, were arrested for the theft. After much fanfare, including a tour through Italy, the Mona Lisa was returned to the Louvre, where its newfound fame helped make it one of the most viewed artworks on Earth. Number 1. Letting the mail fraud come to you in the U.S., it's pretty easy to change your mailing address. Just fill out a form either in person or online, and mail is forwarded from your old address to your new one. The U.S. Postal Service validates the change by sending confirmation of the change to the new address and to the old one. Unless someone at either address calls to complain upon receiving this notice, the mail will be forwarded to the new address. One man was allegedly able to exploit this process, filling out a form forwarding all U.S. Postal Service mail sent to UPS corporate headquarters to his apartment in Chicago. Deshaun Anderson Spruce, who is accused of mail theft and fraud, apparently signed his own initials on the change of address form before crossing them out and signing UPS. Apparently, someone in the UPS mail room overlooked the corresponding confirmation note received at the old address. This was enough to have all of UPS's corporate mail forwarded to his apartment for months before anyone caught on, even as Henderson Spruce received so much mail at his apartment that his mail carrier had to station an extra bin at his door to hold it all. The crime came to light when Henderson Spruce allegedly deposited checks made out to UPS for nearly $60,000 into his own bank account. According to court documents, when police searched Henderson Spruce's apartment, they found thousands of letters that were addressed to UPS. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. But if you're looking for something else to watch right now, got another channel. It's called Biographics, Biographies of Notable People from History. You can find a link to that on the screen now. And as always, thank you for watching.